my uh, mic is okay? Yeah, sure. Mic check. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. How are we doing today? It's good to see all of you. So there are people in the know who say that Barbara Roberts caused the downfall of the New England Mafia. She did this not by killing someone or sending someone to jail, but by keeping someone alive and out of prison for about a year too long. Dr. Barbara Roberts was the first woman to practice adult cardiology in the state of Rhode Island. She founded and directed the Women's Cardiac Center at the Miriam Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island from 2002 to 2016. And during those years, she lectured in the United States and in many foreign countries on heart health and gender specific aspects of heart disease. She is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the American College of Physicians. And for some that don't know, we are going to be doing a book signing immediately afterwards, and you will be able to purchase that book uh, right behind us at the concession, concession stand. So with that being said, she is the author of The Dr. Broad, A Mafia Love Story. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Barbara Roberts. Thank you for that kind introduction, Shakela. And I want to thank the rest of the staff of the Mob Museum for arranging this event. I also am very grateful to all of you who came out tonight to listen to me talk about my lurid past as a mob doctor and a mob mistress. Now imagine for a moment that you were taking a creative writing course. And imagine that the teacher wants you to invent a character who would be the least likely person ever to have anything to do with the Mafia. Well, you might invent a character with a background much like mine. Because I was raised as the oldest of ten children in a devout Catholic family. My parents were part of the Catholic Worker Movement, which was founded by the radical Catholic pacifist Dorothy Day. The aim of the movement was, quote, to live in accordance with the justice and charity of Jesus Christ. Members believed in strict adherence to the dictates of the Catholic Church, particularly with regard to birth control. My parents and a group of like-minded friends wanted to raise their children away from, them, away from the temptations of the big city. The big city, in this case, being New York. So they and several of their friends pooled their meager resources in, and bought 52 acres of land in what was then called the country and is now called the suburbs, about 25 miles north of New York City in Rockland County. And they named their community Mary Crest in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. My, um, so anyway, this is my parents on their wedding day in 1943. Despite knowing next to nothing about building homes, they all pitched in and helped one another build their homes for their growing families. Ours was the first house to be completed, and we moved there in November of 1950. The house was unfinished. There was no central heating. The whole house was heated, or not heated, by a pot-bellied stove in the living room. That winter, we went to bed fully dressed, wearing wool hats and mittens. The electric lines hadn't been run in yet. We had a generator that was just enough to run the pump so that the water from the artesian well could get to the faucets and just enough to run the hot water heater so that we had hot water. We were taken to mass every Sunday 
We all made our first communion. We were all confirmed. We celebrated our patron saint's feast day as well as our birthdays. We were raised to be saints, preferably martyrs, because if you died for your faith, you went straight to heaven, you bypassed purgatory, and you avoided hell no matter how many terrible sins you had committed during your life. There was a plaque that hung on our dining room wall, and the plaque read, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen host at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. Talk about Big Brother. My father's favorite expression was, rally round your priests blindly. But it became apparent to me at a very young age that my mother's life, as well as that of the other Mary Crest mothers, was very difficult, with ceaseless pregnancies and childbearing, endless cleaning and cooking, and constant household chores. My mother had 10, yo- 10 children in 10 years and three months. Money was in short supply. And as his family grew and our poverty increased, my father descended into alcoholism. As the eldest, I was responsible for helping my mother. In fact, by the time I was eight years old, when my mother went into the hospital to have that year's baby, I would be taken out of school and I would stay home and take care of my younger siblings while my father went off to work. I resolved to have a life as different from my mother's as it was possible to get. My father worshipped priests and doctors. I knew I didn't have a prayer of becoming a priest, so I decided to become a doctor at a time when that was a most unusual ambition for a girl, at a time when there were quotas on the number of women who could be accepted into a medical school class. No medical school class had more than 10% women. After high school, I attended Barnard College in New York City, and it was there that I met, fell in love with, and married my first husband, star Columbia University quarterback, Archie Roberts. We were both pre-med students and determined to become doctors, but Archie very much wanted to play professional football also. During his senior year in college, he signed a unique deal with the Cleveland Browns. And this came about because of the friendship that had developed between the owner of the Cleveland Browns, Art Modell, and the chief of medicine at Case Western Reserve University, a physician by the name of Dr. Austin Weisberger. Ernie Davis, a Heisman Trophy winner, had been assigned by the Browns as a running back, but before he could play, he became ill with leukemia and was cared for by Dr. Weisberger. So Dr. Weisberger and Art Modell came up with this plan whereby Archie could play on the reserve squad for the first two years of medical school, and then he would be allowed to use some of his elective time as a junior to to play on the uh, real team, not just the reserve team. The Browns paid him a salary, so I always say that I was the only woman who ever went to medical school on a football scholarship. (laughs) But it was while I was in medical school that I witnessed things that would cause me to leave the Catholic Church and would set me on the path to political activism. This was before the Supreme Court legalized abortion with the Roe versus Wade decision. During my OBGYN clerkship as a medical student, I saw women come into the emergency room with perforated wounds, in septic shock, even partially disemboweled because abortion was illegal, but they were desperate enough to put themselves in the hands of back alley abortionists. 
I even learned of a woman who died because she asked for and was denied a therapeutic abortion despite the fact that she had end-stage heart disease and end-stage liver disease. I had my first child, Dorothea, whom we called Dory, when I was a sophomore in medical school, and my second child, young Archie, a few weeks after completing my internship. We moved to New Haven in 1969 to continue our training, Archie in surgery and I in internal medicine, at Yale New Haven Hospital. And it was at Yale New Haven Hospital that for the first time I became politically active. By the time we moved to Bethesda a few years later, I was active not only in the pro-choice movement, but also in the anti-Vietnam War movement. So after two years at Yale New Haven Hospital, as I said, we moved to Bethesda. It was the height of the Vietnam War, and all male doctors were being drafted, and most were being sent to Vietnam. If you were a woman with children under the age of 18, you couldn't even join any branch of the armed services in those days. But Archie got a draft deferred position at the NIH, and I got a job there also, which didn't come with a draft deferral because I didn't need it. My increasing political activism put a strain on our marriage. I was invited to speak at demonstrations, teach-ins, on radio, on television, in fact, I spoke at the last mass anti-Vietnam War demonstration on the grounds of the Washington Monument the day of Nixon's inauguration in 1973 in front of a crowd estimated at 100,000 people. Prior to that, at another demonstration I spoke at in New York City, I shared the speaker's platform with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, but I was too shy to talk to them. Archie wanted me to be the obedient, docile, devout young woman he had married. But I had become a radical feminist. I wanted him to do half the housework, half the childcare. Yeah, fat chance. We divorced, and not long afterwards, Archie remarried. I moved to Boston to do a fellowship in cardiology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital which is one of the teaching hospitals of Harvard University. It was there that I met a man by the name of Ned Bresnahan when he answered an advertisement I put in the newspaper for a live-in babysitter. Ned told me that he was a part-time student at Boston University. Our relationship evolved from employer-employee to friend and eventually to lovers. When I finished my cardiology training in Boston, he moved with us to Hershey, Pennsylvania, where I took my first full-time job as a fully-fledged cardiologist at the Hershey Medical Center, which was part of the Penn State Medical School. And that was where our daughter, Megan, was born. Despite his wishes, we never married. Ned had no interest in working a regular job, and I needed someone to take care of my now three children, so for a while, things went well. Unfortunately, much like my father, Ned became a severe alcoholic and was also using drugs. And by the time we moved to Providence in 1977, our relationship was ending. Furious that he would now have to support himself, Ned, became, Ned began a campaign of harassment, which would only escalate over the ensuing few years and would culminate in one of the longest running custody battles in the Rhode Island family court. As you heard, I went into private practice in the summer of 1977 as the first female adult cardiologist to practice in the state. Cardiologists depend on referrals from other physicians. So in order to become better known in the community, 
I started attending various hospital conferences. And one of the conferences was a weekly cardiac catheterization conference where we would discuss patients who had, un who had undergone that diagnostic procedure in the previous week. And we would discuss the best way to treat that patient. One day, an older, rather bombastic male cardiologist was holding forth at great length about how he thought a patient should have open heart surgery. But I spoke up and disagreed with him. He was quite put out that I would cast doubt on his recommendation, but I refused to back down. There was a cardiac surgeon at the same conference, and he leaned over to the nurse sitting next to him, and he said, who is that woman? And she replied, oh, that's Dr. Barbara Roberts. She's the new cardiologist in town. And he said to himself, that woman has balls. <laughs> and he started referring me patients. One of the first patients he referred to me was John Cicilline Sr., whose son, John Cicilline Jr., was the preeminent criminal defense attorney in Rhode Island. Jack Cicilline's father had had a massive heart attack and was taken to an outlying hospital. Unfortunately, by the time he was transferred to the Miriam, other than manipulate his medicines, there was little we could do for him because the damage had already been done. But during the six weeks he spent in our coronary care unit before he died, I became very good friends not only with Jack, but with his wife, with his children, with his siblings, and with many of his friends, among whom was Raymond Junior Patriarcha, known to one and all as Junior. You could not grow up in the Northeast in the 1950s and 60s as I had without knowing who Raymond was, because he was often in the news, identified as the head of the New England Mafia, and he was frequently called upon to testify in front of congressional committees, including the Kefauver Committee, which is mentioned in some of the museum exhibits. He was sometimes referred to as Rhode Island's public enemy number one. Junior told me that he was unhappy with the care his father was receiving, and he asked if I would take his father, Raymond Sr., on as a patient. Now, I knew that Raymond Sr. had been diabetic since the 1940s, and I knew that he had had a heart attack in the 1960s. In fact, when he had his heart attack in the 1960s, he was seen in consultation by Dr. Paul Dudley White, who was the preeminent cardiologist in the country at that time. In fact, when President Dwight David Eisenhower had his heart attack, Paul Dudley White took care of him. And knowing as I did that both diabetes and coronary artery disease were progressive illnesses, I, suspe I suspected that by now, and we're talking 1980, that Raymond was probably quite debilitated. But as far as I knew, Raymond was living quietly at home with his second wife, Rita O'Toole Patriarcha, his first wife having died of cancer. And as far as anyone knew, or anyone in his family knew, he was not facing any legal charges. So I said to Junior, sure, I'd be happy to see your father. Just call my office and set up an appointment, which he did. But before that appointment could take place, Raymond was admitted to Fatima Hospital with a gangrenous toe, a dreaded complication of diabetes, and he underwent an amputation. I told Junior, no problem. When your father is discharged, call the office and reschedule his appointment, which he did. But within a day or two of being discharged from that hospitalization, Two policemen showed up at Raymond Sr.'s door one evening while he was having dinner and arrested him on charges of accessory and conspiracy to murder based on, the based on the testimony of an informant. It was December 4th, 
1980. It's easy for me to remember December 4th because that's my patron saint's feast day. St. Barbara was the patron saint of earthquakes, tropical storms, and artillery gunners. I happened to be in Jack's office that evening because Jack and his brother Steve were representing me in the lawsuit brought by Ned Bresnahan, the father of my youngest daughter, Megan. He was suing me for common law divorce, palimony, and custody of our young daughter on the grounds that I was an unfit mother. Suddenly, a friend of Junior's, Maddie Guglielmetti, burst into the office, pale as a ghost, and said, they've just arrested Senior, and they've taken him to the Situate State Police Barracks, and Rita and Junior are very worried about him. They want him to be checked by one of his doctors, but we can't reach any of them. And I said, well, let me try, but I couldn't reach any of them either. Maddie kept insisting that Raymond had to be checked, even though he had taken his insulin, he was too upset to finish his meal, and he had forgotten his nitroglycerin. As far as I was concerned, I had already agreed to be his physician, so finally I said, all right, I'll go and check on him. Cloistered in the car, driven by a young lawyer in Jack's office, I was seized with a sudden panic attack. I felt as if I was about to take center stage in a long-running hit play with no idea of what my lines were and only the foggiest notion of what the playwright intended. I was expecting the scene at the state police barracks to be somber with everybody talking in hushed voices, very, you know, serious. But when we got there, it was more like a rowdy tailgate party at a college homecoming weekend. The reception area was full of people, and the only one I recognized was Jack Cicilline. And Jack seemed to be in great good humor. He was introducing me to several of the lawmen. This is Raymond's cardiologist. I want her to check on him. He's only recently out of the hospital. Now, Raymond was nowhere to be seen, and I was told that he was in Major Lionel Benjamin's office. Major Benjamin was the second in command of the Rhode Island State Police in those days. So this is 1980, which is about eight years after the Godfather movie first came out. What do you think when you're about to meet a mafia don for the first time? What image do you have in your head? Something like Marlon Brando, right? But what confronted me that night was someone radically different. Raymond, when I finally got to meet him, looked more like a wizened little Italian cobbler than an all-powerful mafioso. My first thought on seeing him was, my God, he's so tiny. And my second thought was, holy shice, he looks like he's going to have a cardiac arrest any minute and I'll never be able to resuscitate him here. Because he was cyanotic. His color was blue-gray. He was sweaty, and he had very labored breathing. Then when I checked his pulse, I became even more alarmed because his pulse was highly erratic. At that point, he'd been having angina pain for almost two hours, and an erratic pulse and someone, ha someone having a prolonged attack of angina can be a harbinger of sudden cardiac death. I told Major Benjamin that Mr. Patriarca was very sick and needed to be admitted to the hospital immediately. No way, he said. This man's just been arrested on a capital charge. But I kept insisting that Raymond was very sick. And so finally he said, you're going to have to speak to Colonel Stone. Stone was a long-time, revered head of the Rhode Island State Police, and he wanted Raymond's arrest and subsequent conviction to cap his long and distinguished career in law enforcement. Colonel Stone, when I reached him by phone, was adamant that Raymond was not going to the hospital. 
But again, I kept insisting that otherwise, Raymond was at a significant risk of having a heart attack, if not dying. Finally, he said, well, you'll have to speak to the state police surgeon. So he gave me the name and the number, and I called the state police surgeon. And when I explained the results of my history and physical exam, he said, oh, Dr. Roberts, you're absolutely right. This man has to go right to the hospital. So I called Colonel Stone back, at which point he said, OK, but I want him taken to Fatima Hospital, where I didn't have privileges and wouldn't be able to take care, for, care of him, because that's the only place where we can keep him under 24-hour day armed guard. That's not true, Colonel Stone, I said. Remember Anthony Femini? Anthony Femini, coincidentally, another client of Jack's, while he was out on bail on a murder charge, was shot in the head, rolled up in a rug, stuffed in the trunk of a car, and left for dead. However, he was found and was still alive, and he was taken to the Miriam Hospital and resuscitated where he was kept on the 24-hour day armed guard. When I reminded him of this, Colonel Stone relented and agreed to Raymond's being admitted to the Miriam Hospital. Jack later told me that he was shocked that I'd, been, that I'd been able to whisk Raymond away from the state police barracks. In truth, so was I. Raymond's arms and legs were shackled, and we were placed in the back of a state police cruiser with a rifle-toting guard sitting next to us. There was another armed trooper in the front. Half a dozen cars accompanied us, filled with cops, lawyers, and by now reporters. We took off into the night, lights flashing, sirens wailing, the first of a number of similar rides that I would take with Raymond over the ensuing months. The next day, Raymond's arrest was front page news on the Providence Journal. And within another day or two, I had been publicly identified as his, physicians, as his physician. A day or two later, I got a call from a young Italian-American man that I had dated briefly when I first moved to Rhode Island, and even after we no longer dated, we remained friends. He told me he had a funny story he wanted to tell me. The day before, a friend of his had called and said, Hey, Vinny, remember that doctor broad you used to date? She's the old man's doctor now. And I thought this was hilarious, because to me, abroad was a woman with large breasts and no brains, and I was just the opposite. At least I'm sure that I don't have large breasts. <laughs> Years later, this nickname would come to seem like the perfect title for my memoir. Thus began Raymond's first hospitalization under my care. It lasted almost two months, because not only was his angina difficult to control, but he also developed osteomyelitis, or a bone infection, in the foot that had undergone the toe amputation. Any mention of his legal problems would cause him to have angina. And how do I know he wasn't faking it? It was very easy. When someone who is having angina, which is a symptom people have when the, their heart is starved for oxygen, there are characteristic changes that occur in the EKG. And we witnessed this on multiple occasions, when Raymond was in the hospital and in other places where he was hooked up to a cardiac monitor. I began to realize that putting Raymond on trial was tantamount to a death sentence and I resolved to do everything in my power to keep him from going to trial. The police and the prosecutors were not willing to take my word for how sick he was, and they hired other cardiologists to examine him and to determine his risk from being put on trial. Not one of them disagreed with me about the severity of Raymond's illness or the dangers that would ensue 
from making him subject to legal proceedings. In the coming months and years, I would testify in multiple courts, both state and federal, that in my professional opinion, putting Raymond on trial would carry a significant risk of causing his death. Needless to say, this did not endear me to the police, the FBI, or the Providence Journal newspaper. On January 12, 1981, Raymond was formally arraigned in his hospital bed on the charge of being accessory before the fact of the 1965 slaying of Raymond Baby Curcio and was granted bail. A week later, I discharged him to home. Now, ordinarily, after a hospitalization, I would schedule a follow-up appointment in my office to see that patient. But I told Raymond, I'm afraid that if you travel to see me in my office, the prosecutors will say, well, if he's well enough to travel to his o her office, he's well enough to travel to court. So I told Raymond, rather than have you come to my office, I'm going to make house calls to check on you. He and Rita lived in a very modest ranch house in the Providence suburb of Johnston. Raymond spent much of his time in a recliner in the den, reading newspapers and watching television. Rita would make us lunch, and she was a very good cook. Raymond was utterly dependent on Raymond. On, on, uh, Raymond was utterly dependent on Rita. The diabetes had caused such severe damage to his hands that he couldn't even dress himself. He couldn't button his buttons. Rita had to dress him. He couldn't cut his own food. Rita had to cut his food so he could eat. Rita had to give him his insulin shots. Raymond's legal and medical problems sent him into a profound depression. And depression can increase the risk of dying in heart patients. So I cast around for ways to treat his depression, and I found one that always brightened his mood. My youngest daughter, Megan, was now a bright, talkative four-year-old who was attending Montessori Nursery School in the mornings. I would sometimes bring Megan with me on my weekly house calls. Soon she was calling him Uncle Raymond and chattering to him about her friends and all their doings. And Raymond started slipping her a $20 bill when we were leaving, telling her, take your mother someplace nice. Before long, she would have her hand out as she went to kiss Raymond goodbye, which he found highly amusing, perhaps recognizing something of himself in the brash four-year-old. On a house call that winter, fearing that Raymond was going stir-crazy with only the television and reader for company, I told him that I wanted us to go for an outing that Sunday. He was reluctant at first, always wary of causing me more problems than I already had and giving ammunition to those who claimed that he wasn't sick. But I convinced him that one dinner at a restaurant accompanied by me would be unlikely to prove that he was well enough to stand trial. So on a brisk, sunny day that winter, Raymond Sr., his wife Rita, his daughter-in-law Barbara, Megan and I all piled into Raymond's 1969 Cadillac and headed for the Coast Guard House, a restaurant located right on the ocean in Narragansett. On the drive back, Megan decided that we all had to take turns singing stanzas of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. And we each had to choose the animal when it was our turn. When it was Raymond's turn, if he didn't immediately come up with an animal, Megan would say, come on, Uncle Raymond, it's your turn. <laughs> it was hilarious to hear a four-year-old bossing around the boss as he did his best to keep up with the singing. 
A month or two later, Raymond became very upset after learning that the police had stopped his daughter-in-law Barbara's car while she was driving with his grandson Christopher. Raymond developed severe angina and had to be hospitalized again. Within hours of that admission, Raymond was indicted by a grand jury in New Bedford, Massachusetts for allegedly ordering the 1968 execution of a man by the name of Bobby Candos, again, based on the testimony of an informant. Jack tried to have his arraignment postponed, but the judge insisted that Raymond be brought to court in New Bedford. More than a dozen cars were, he were leading and following the ambulance as I accompanied Raymond to the arraignment. I had sedated him and given him prophylactic nitroglycerin, and I was aided by a CCU nurse. He was hooked up to an intravenous line, and I was carrying a doctor's bag filled with drugs I hoped I wouldn't have to use. We exited the ambulance and hurried into the courthouse, stared at by hundreds of spectators and dozens of reporters and television cameramen. Inside, I sat next to Raymond on his stretcher, my eyes glued to the cardiac monitor that displayed his EKG. Not five minutes into the proceedings, I noticed the characteristic changes in his EKG, and I leaned over and whispered, Raymond, are you having angina? And he admitted that he was. I told Jack, who informed the judge, and they let me take him into another room where he wouldn't have to hear the proceedings, and I gave him additional oxygen and more nitroglycerin, and his angina resolved. It recurred once more in the hour that was left of the proceedings, but again it responded to medication, and eventually bail was set at $50,000, and Raymond was returned to the hospital in the ambulance. Only one thing kept these proceedings off the front page of the Providence Journal the next day, March 31st, 1981. President Reagan and his aide James Brady had been shot by John Hinckley. That was the story that made the front page. In reporting about the arraignment, the newspaper repeated a statement by a police chief that Raymond's most recent hospitalization was simply a ploy to enable him to delay a court appearance. The Providence Journal never passed up an opportunity to impugn my professional judgment. Raymond felt very bad about the negative publicity I was subjected to. On more than one occasion, he said to me, you saved my life. I know you saved my life. I couldn't love you more if you were my own daughter. At one point, I said to him, Raymond, you'll go to trial over my dead body. At this, he gave a rare smile. The following month, the Providence Journal published a cover article about me in the Sunday magazine. The title was, Who is the Real Dr. Roberts? And the cover depicted, depicted watercolor drawings of my face my ex-husband, Archie, in his football uniform, a microscope, Jack Cicilline's face, and Raymond in a suit jacket with a cigar in his mouth. I had not wanted the article to be written, knowing how likely it was to cause my children grief and to cause even more gossip about my private life. Megan's father had been interviewed for the article, my ex-husband had been interviewed by the article, and others who knew me, so I finally agreed to be interviewed myself. That Sunday, as I was making rounds, I was approaching the nurse's station on the fourth floor, and I overheard two nurses gossiping. One said to the other, did you read the article about Dr. Roberts in the paper today? And her friend said, nah, I'm going to wait for the movie. It was at that moment that I began to realize that my story might be of interest to people, 
and the seed of the idea of writing a memoir was planted. My daughter Megan's father, Ned, was persisting in his lawsuit against me. My then boyfriend, George Gregory, and I had to rescue Megan from his one-room apartment one Sunday when he had visitation, and she called me crying hysterically, terrified, and begging me to bring her home. We broke into the apartment and brought Megan home with us, and I told George to make himself scarce, because Ned told us he was calling the police. The police showed up at my home shortly afterwards and asked where George was. I told the police I didn't know where he was. And I later found out that Ned was repeatedly calling the police, demanding that George and I be arrested. I was in family court a few days later when Jack Cicilline's secretary paged me to tell me that there was a warrant out for my arrest. After family court, I surrendered and was taken to the police station where I was mugged, booked, and fingerprinted. I was charged with felony breaking and entering, daylight, occupied dwelling, five to seven years if convicted. George was later arrested on the same charge. The next day, the Providence Journal re carried reports both in the morning paper and in the evening bulletin about my arrest under the headline, Doctor Released on Charge Linked to Girl's Custody. Of course, the article had to mention that I was Raymond's doctor. I was reminded of what Adlai Stevenson said on losing the presidential election to President Eisenhower. He said, it hurts too much to laugh, and I'm too old to cry. By the fall of 1981, George and I had broken up. And on a Friday in September, Jack Cicilline invited me to lunch on Federal Hill in the Italian section of Providence to a restaurant I hadn't been to before called The Forum. A man I took to be the manager came over to greet us as soon as we entered. He was of medium height and carried himself with an effortless but steely dignity. He was bald on the top of his head with clo close cropped gray hair. He had a tanned face and a slight but unplaceable accent. I guessed his age at somewhere in the 50s. There was an indefinable aura about him that I found compelling. Jack, he said, shaking Jack's hand, and giving me a look of polite inquiry. Welcome to the forum. Hi, Lewis, Jack replied. Meet my friend, Dr. Barbara Roberts. Barbara, meet Lewis Monacchio. The name set off instant alarm bells in my mind. Was this, I wondered, the Lewis Monacchio? The one who'd been on the lam for 10 years and had only recently returned to Rhode Island? I'm very pleased to meet you, Lewis said, leading us to a table by the window. Lewis was kept busy with the normal bustle of a restaurant at lunchtime, but he would frequently come over to our table and chat. I had the distinct impression that he knew who I was. He emanated a subtle authority that made his attentiveness both flattering and seductive. When we left the restaurant, I asked Jack if Lewis was the one they call Baby Shanks. He's the one, Jack replied, and I think you made a big impression. I felt very attracted to Lewis, which surprised me before, because I'd never before been attracted to someone so much older than I. Lewis was 54 to my 37. I knew it would be insanity to become involved with Lewis, despite what I had to admit to myself was an intense and probably mutual attraction. The credibility of my testimony on Raymond's health would be severely impaired, if not destroyed, if I became intimate with Lewis and the relationship became known. But the heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> 
and within a few months, we were lovers. And so our affair began. I knew that what I was doing was wrong, not for any re reasons relating to sexual morality, neither of us was married, but because my first responsibility was to my children, who would be harmed if I became even more notorious, and my second was to Raymond, who could be subjected to trial if my credibility were damaged. I can only say that I paid a heavy price, one that pushed me to the brink of madness and left me for a time shattered and maimed and inconsolable. In addition to the murder charges relating to Raymond Curcio and Bobby Candos, Raymond was indicted by a federal grand jury in Florida on labor racketeering charges in 1983. Prosecutors were hoping to compel Raymond to travel to Florida to be arraigned. Once again, I had to submit reports on his condition. An independent cardiologist who had consulted on Raymond in the past at the request of prosecutors was again consulted, but he wrote, quote, the risk to Mr. Patriarcher's medical condition that is posed by travel to Florida for the stated purpose is sufficient to render such transportation and subsequent arraignment ill-advised from a medical standpoint. After expending thousands of dollars, neither Rhode Island nor Massachusetts nor the federal government was able to find a physician whose testimony about the seriousness of Raymond's condition contradicted my own. On Monday, July 9th, 1984, I made my usual weekly house call on Raymond. He appeared much the same, a shrunken, frail, elderly man. It seemed impossible that he ruled what law enforcement called a vast criminal enterprise. We talked, I examined him, we had lunch, and I left. It was the last time I saw him alive. Two days later, he collapsed and was taken by ambulance to the Rhode Island Hospital Emergency Room, where he could not be resuscitated. On July 11, 1984, Raymond Patriarca was pronounced dead. The event I had been predicting for almost four years had occurred. We had formed a unique alliance, Raymond and I, against the forces of law and order, the ex-Catholic schoolgirl and public enemy number one. As I gazed at his body, along with sadness, a tremendous weight was lifted from my shoulders. I had kept him out of an earthly prison, and the ground to which he was being consigned was the common destination of all of us. My responsibility to him was discharged. The next day, the headline in the Providence Journal read, Crime Boss Patriarcha Dies at 76 of Heart Attack. The newspapers noted that I was in attendance at his death. On Friday, July 13th, I drove up to Federal Hill to pay my last respects to Raymond and to pay my respects to his family. I embraced Rita and Junior. Junior hugged me and tearfully said, you're like a sister to me. I'll never, ever forget what you did for my father. My obligation to protect Raymond's father was over. An era was coming to an end. Now we're going to fast forward five years to 1989. My relationship with Lewis had been over for several years. To learn the rest of that saga, you're gonna to have to read the book <laughs> because it's a long story and I need to leave time for questions. On August 4th of 1989, I met my husband, Joe Avarista, while having dinner on Federal Hill outside what used to be the Forum Restaurant 
where Lewis and I had met in 1981. Joe and I have been together ever since. We have traveled over much of the world and have had many adventures. My children are all grown and pursuing their careers. Joe and I live in Jamestown, a beautiful island in Narragansett Bay, with lovely views of the bay and the Newport Bridge. In the year 2000, I began work on the first draft of The Doctor Broad, but I didn't want it to be published while I was still seeing patients. When I retired in 2016, I set about rewriting the manuscript. By then, I had already had three other books published, all medical books directed at a lay audience. And I knew that the hardest part of getting a book published was finding an agent, because most publishers won't consider a book unless an agent represents it. Little did I know that a unique opportunity was soon to present itself, which would make finding an agent for the doctor broad a cinch. The ex-wife of notorious Providence Mayor Buddy Cianci, Sheila Bentley and I, had bonded in the 1980s of, over both being infamous Rhode Island women. We were having lunch one day in the fall of 2016, and she showed me an article in the Providence Journal, which was headlined, Crime Town Comes to Providence, with pictures of Buddy and Raymond Sr. The article noted that Emmy Award-winning producers Mark Smerling and Zach Stewart Pontier were making a podcast which would examine the intersection of organized crime and politics in Rhode Island. Sheila said that they were very interested in interviewing me for the podcast. I wasn't sure if I wanted to participate since I had never spoken publicly about my years as Raymond's physician and about my affair with Lewis. But I agreed to meet with Mark Smerling, and on November 12, 2016, Mark came to my home in Jamestown. After listening to the tape of the first episode, I agreed to tell my story on the podcast. Mark, I said, what do you think you know about me? And he said, well, I know you were Raymond's physician. I said, yes. And while I was Raymond's physician, I was Louis Monacchio's mistress. And his eyes almost bugged out of his head, and his jaw dropped in shock. And over the next few months, Mark taped interviews in which I described publicly for the first time the story of my years as Raymond's doctor and my affair with Lewis. Crime Town, the podcast, season one, episode 11, The Doctor Broad, aired on March 5th, 2017. Ironically, Joe and I were vacationing in Sicily at the time. It was downloaded more than 400,000 times in the first 24 hours after it was released. And to date, season one of Crime Town has been downloaded 100 million times around the globe. It did help me get the book published because my soon-to-be agent was a big fan of Crime Towns. And when he heard from a mutual acquaintance that I had written a memoir, he got in touch with me and asked to become my agent. The Dr. Broad, A Mafia Love Story was published in September 2019. It is available in bookstores and through online booksellers like Amazon. And as you can see, I've resumed the book tour that was interrupted by COVID. I hope you enjoy reading it, and now I'd be happy to answer questions. Dr. Barbara Roberts, the author of The Doctor Broad, A Mafia Love Story, thank you so much for tonight's presentation. Does anyone here in the room have questions? We can use this mic or I can come over to you as well. Do I see a hand? Any, yep. Be the, um, the Pastor Aka, family was in 
was in a conflict with the Winter Hill Gang of Why the Bulger. Did you ever meet or come across any Winter Hill mafiosi? No, I never met Whitey Bulger. You know, I met several of what I like to call the AOCFs. That stands for Alleged Organized Crime Figures. In fact, I wound up being a doctor to many of them. Uh, I also wound up being a doctor to many of the police that were pursuing them. Sometimes my waiting room would look like a mini Appalachian, you know, that famous <laughs> raid in upstate New York but I never saw them be anything but civil and cordial to each other in my waiting room. But some of these guys were real characters. I'll, I'll just tell you this story about one of them. He was a man who, with his brother, was convicted of murder of a man uh, in Johnston, Rhode Island. Actually, the man who was my patient, his brother, was probably innocent. His brother was, probably, was guilty. But anyway, while this gentleman was in prison for murder, he became morbidly obese, and he developed heart disease. And somehow or other, he convinced the prison authorities that I was the only cardiologist he would see. So he showed up for his first appointment with two armed guards, with chains on his arms and his legs, and here's, you know, my waiting room of mostly, you know, little old people sitting there quivering. <laughs> um, but I brought him into my consulting room, and I took his history, and then I brought him into the exam room. And I said to the guards, take his chains off so I can get an accurate weight. And they looked at me like I was out of my mind, and I just looked at them with my eyebrows raised, and they realized that no way was this guy going to try and escape and cause a problem for me, right? So I weighed him, and I uh, had him undressed from the waist up, and I listened in the back to his lungs, I listened to his heart, and then I had, had him lie down. He had this enormous belly, right? And when I went to examine his abdomen, I took a closer look, and he had a tattoo. And what was the tattoo of? It was the pink panther with a massive erection. <laughs> and I'm like biting the inside of my cheeks to keep from laughing out loud. And then when my poor little medical assistant came in to do his EKG, she turned bright red. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, I didn't meet any of the Winter Hill Gang. You know, Raymond was very protective of me. He, you know, he, as much as possible, you know, shielded me from anything I didn't need to know. And people say to me sometimes, you know, how could you have taken care of someone who was so evil? And I always say, you know, when you graduate from medical school, you take the Hippocratic Oath. And central to the Hippocratic Oath are two things. Number one, I will do no harm. And number two, I will put my patient's interests ahead of my own. Not my patients who aren't facing t felony charges. Not my patients who aren't in prison. Any patient who entrusts his or her heart to my care, I will put their, their interests ahead of my own. And that's what I tried to do at some personal cost during the years I was Raymond's physician. But I saw a very different person from the person you read about in the newspapers. The man I saw was very ill, very debilitated, very depressed. And he knew instinctively that another trial would cause his death. And there's no death penalty in Rhode Island. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Did you lose any patients because of your association with him, <laughs> that people were outwardly outspoken that they didn't want to see you anymore because of it? Yeah. You know, there were some doctors who stopped referring me patients 
because I was taking care of Raymond. But I think that was more than made up for by patients who referred themselves to me. And I think they're thinking when something like, well, Raymond can afford the best. So if he's going to her, she must be the best, and I want to go to her too. Whatever happened to Ned in your family court case? Oh, I won. Yeah, I won. In fact, at the end of the trial, he was under court order not to call me, not to call DC, the Department of Children and their families, because he was always calling DCYF and accusing me of neglecting and abusing the children. He was uh, stopped from calling other physicians, the hospital, my parents, and he moved out of town. And then many years later, he moved back to Rhode Island, and he started writing me letters demanding that he be able to see Megan. And Megan by now was about 15, 14 or 15. And I said to Megan, you know, just because I choose not to have anything to do with your father, that doesn't mean that you have to make the same choice. If you want to see your father, I won't stand in the way. She said, Mom, I don't want to have anything to do with him. He was crazy. I remember what he put us through. But within a few months, he committed suicide. And then she felt horribly guilty and felt like it was her fault and that if she had agreed to see him, he wouldn't have committed suicide, which I think is wrong, but. First of all, you're a rock star. <laughs> Thank you. Secondly, what happened with your criminal case where you were facing five to seven years for the break-in? That's if a good you, question. If you don't want to answer, I understand. No, the charges were dropped. And the reason, the alleged reason the charges were dropped was because the prosecution said they couldn't locate Ned. They knew exactly where Ned was. He was living in Providence, working as a companion for an elderly retired industrialist. But in order to save face, they dropped the charges. You know, before I was Raymond's physician, Ned would call the police on multiple occasions and saying that I had assaulted him. And the first time they came to my house, I, I said to the officer, are you serious? I said, look at me. I'm five foot four, I weigh 110 pounds soaking wet. He's six two, goes at 190. Who do you think assaulted who? So they stopped responding to his multiple calls about me until I became Raymond's physician. And that's when I was arrested. Any other questions? Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Again, we are doing a, a short book signing immediately afterwards. You can purchase Dr. Barbara Roberts' book in the concession stands. Um, right in the lobby behind the courtroom, and she will be uh, sitting right here to sign those books as well. Again, thank you, and a big round of applause for Dr. Barbara Roberts. Thank you all. You're a great audience. I appreciate your coming. <laughs>